Isaiah is an amazing book, but it's not as so easy to teach on. So I'm really impressed by your willingness to jump in there. And um, Father, we just want to speak a blessing over Carolyn today. And uh, we just publicly say thank you for working so hard and um, just coming to bless us today with God's word. So Lord, as she's here to bless, uh, we pray that she would be blessed and that uh, uh, sharing this word would be a joy. So we, we invite the joy of the Lord to fill her today. And we just thank you that she doesn't have to teach out of her own abilities, but she, uh, she can draw on the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the gifting of the Holy Spirit. And so we just uh, receive her today as sent from God, uh, deliverer of your word, and we just uh, bless her as she's here to bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, it is a joy to be here. And um, <clears throat> excuse my voice, I'm having a little trouble <clears throat> with my throat, but... Um, I'm excited to be here. First, I was terrified, I'll admit it, because Isaiah is um, very difficult. Actually, I have to tell you that the Old Testament has usually been difficult for me. And that was until I realized that I'm grafted in, so I'm an Israelite. I'm a Jewish person, and a lot of the Old Testament is talking about me, and it's talking about how, you know, how can I take that ancient word and bring it into today. So we've just spent uh, many weeks going through the whole book of uh, Isaiah, and first 42 chapters prior to me mostly there's a lot of talk now remember Isaiah is a priest and a prophet what does that mean it means that he's a friend of God he's a priest and he's prophetic and God talks to him and he gave him such powerful words I'm just astounded so the first 42 books talk a lot about hey guys you weren't listening you know we had this covenant hello remember who I am what'd you do with it you know you betrayed me and you're now uh, involved in pagan practices of the Canaanites you know what what's going on here and I'm sorry but you will be punished for what you've done. So that's the last several weeks up the first 42 books. And now I get to, to talk a little bit about some of the other things. And <clears throat> I get to talk about the fact that God is not only here to direct us, guide us, uh, discipline us, but he's going to redeem us. And why is he going to do that? Oh, it's so exciting. So, <clears throat> this, this series this week, chapter 43 to 48, we titled The Victory of God because God is always in charge. Now, no matter how disobedient they were or how disobedient you are today, God's in charge. He loves you. He made you. He's revealing himself to you. And when you get it up from up here, knowledge of it, down here to living it, he's going to redeem you. He's going to make everything okay. So... <clears throat> In these five chapters, he reveals his promises to restore, and I say with a new exodus. So what does that mean? Because there was an exodus. They, they left um, Egypt. He brought them out of Egypt. It was his doing. And he's going to bring them out of Babylon. So he's already told them they're going to be um, captured. They're going to be exiled to Babylon, but he is going to bring them back. 
And um, as I got deeper into this, I've just, you know, sometimes I try to read fast what I don't understand. I want to get through it and get over it. But uh, I, I thought it was interesting. He said that how I'm going to bring you back, I'm, I'm going to use Cyrus. Well, who the heck is Cyrus? Cyrus hadn't been born. Cyrus was born 200 years later, and yet God said, I'm going to use Cyrus to bring you back. So sometimes he's told us things about our future, or you have a sense about it, where he's leading you, and it takes a long time. And I realize that God's time is not our timing. He is so patient, and I'm so impatient. So I look at young people, like my dear friend. <laughs> um, when we're young, we want to hurry up. I, you know, when I was 10, I wanted to be 18. I wanted to drive a car. I wanted to go on uh, out with friends and have fun. And when I was 18, I was like, I want to be 25. I, we're so impatient. We think there's something out there that we haven't gotten yet. And it's, gonna, it's out there and I'm going to get it. No, he wants you to live today. He wants you to be patient and live in the day. So he reminds his chosen people then uh, in another chapter of who he is. Now why does he have to remind us who he is? If we really knew who he was and that he had the best for us, why wouldn't we just be obedient? Wow, I'm, that's the quickest way to get where he wants you to go. Not debate, not rationalize, but he just wants you to get up and do it. So he has to remind the chosen people who he is. And he has a little thing he does, God versus the little gods. So he even represents himself as if he was on trial in chapter 44. Like, hey... You're my witnesses. You've been with me all this time, and you should know me by now. And so, uh, to me, I said, well, wh why does he have to do that? Because if people really trusted him, they would be following him. So this is an issue of trust. And he's trying to remind them, haven't I been trustworthy in the past? Didn't I bring you out of Egypt? You know, I can do it again. So he's, he's saying, don't fear me. And then he says that he is going to do a new thing. Now, we're lucky we know what his new thing is. <laughs> they had no idea what that meant. A new thing. Oh, yeah, right. Um, oh, I get to make another wooden... God, an idol, uh, whatever. No, um, he's going to do. He's going to do a very new thing, and we'll talk about that. So, if I could ask, um, oh, how about my friend Ken? Would you read this scripture for us? Uh, but now, this is what the Lord says: He who created you, Jacob. He who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Thank you. Wow. This doesn't sound, look all that exciting, does it? Huh. But it's so rich. Every sentence here I discovered, and it took me a while. I don't discover these things like I sit down and the Holy Spirit just revealed this to me. And he's like, yeah, well, be patient. I have to read it five or six times. I've, I've been studying this for a month. So this is what the Lord says. You know, I created you and formed you. Well, when you create something, what does that mean? 
you usually have a plan for it before you create it and you have a purpose for it and each one of us grafted in he has a plan and purpose for us so um, why fear the next line do not fear I have redeemed you and what does that mean have that means he already did it he already did it when you accepted Jesus Christ in your life as your Lord and Savior past is done he already redeemed you when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt the Jews he had already he's already done it. so he's reminding them right here look what I've done for you I summoned you by name he knows every hair on your head and when you pass through the waters I will be with you oh, what does that mean now he's not talking about the past anymore he's talking about the future so he tells us we're not going to be overwhelmed by anything and I thought about what, what are those waters that that we're going to pass through well the, of course we already know about the waters of the Red Sea and uh, the Jordan I love I love those stories and well I just have to say what I love about the story about crossing the Jordan was of course it was it was that season of the year where the water was really fast it was high it was deep it was dangerous and God says well take my ark first and cross it and I'll be with you I'll take and you know, I'm like oh my goodness how could we do that and what did he do he went first his ark was his presence he sent his priests out first and they stepped into the water and it stopped a wall came up and they passed through it and that's what he wants you to remember he's already done all of these things and now he says when you pass through the rivers they will not sweep over you when is a future tense and so that future is is everything that tries to overwhelm you when you don't trust and I think it it's already speaking of the new thing because I think it's speaking of the water of the baptism I think it's talking about the living water that he sent to live in each one of us so the, I, I just get so excited about it I love this and when you walk f through the fire you won't be burned well 200 years later when they were uh, taken captured and went to Babylon who had to walk through the fire Meshach Shadrach and Abednego wow. and it reminded me of a story I've heard in America about um, fire that was reported and you may be aware of in Los Angeles in 1906 there was a uh, revival led by the Holy Spirit it was called Azusa Street Revival and there's uh, films about it and books about it because it was so powerful the Holy Spirit was showing up in such power people were being saved people were being healed hundreds of people in the streets and people called the fire department from miles away they said there's a fire we can see the flames and you need to get over there and the fire department showed up and there was no fire it was the fire of the Holy Spirit falling on that place and um, a lot of people speak about that <clears throat> about the Holy Spirit being the fire And he also I'll read this one I will gather you and your children from the east and the west I will say to the north and south bring my sons and daughters back to Israel from the distant corners of the earth and bring my sons from afar my daughters from the ends of the earth everyone who is called by my name that's everybody in this room everybody in this room that has given your life to Jesus Christ 
he knows your name. And then he says, whom I created for my glory and whom I formed and made. He goes on, you know, he's telling them, I'm bringing you back. And he goes on to say, for my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you. So as not to destroy you completely. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. There's that fire again. That burning inside us when, when it's revealed to us that, that we have sin and we need to repent so that he can redeem us again. But for his own sake, you see, it's not just us. It says, for my own sake, I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. So, you know, when I was younger, I thought this world was all about me. All about me. Oh, God wanted me to be happy. He wanted me to have a good time. He wanted life to be great. No. Lord, it took me a while to learn that it's all about Him. It's all about bringing as many people into the kingdom as we can and join us in life everlasting in the next world. So, you know, I thought, well... What bothers me is why do we have to be punished? Why, why do you have to destroy and then redeem us? But of course we, we know from history that just telling us to be good children doesn't work. <laughs> we keep getting swayed and, and, and then I thought about um, the Lord gave Moses priests and judges to set up over the people so that they could watch where, where the laws were being broken so that they could maintain their society on a path of righteousness, right standing with God. So in order for that kind of... Um, system to function or that group of people, society to function, you have to have uh, penalties or consequences when the laws are broken. Otherwise, um, it just fails. So we have to have consequences and we have to be willing to pay the con consequences. So we have a uh, gracious a merciful God who wants to um, who wants to forgive us and and give us another chance and another and another sometimes it goes on and on so <clears throat> next thing he does he reminds the chosen people who he is and he even mentions to them they have imposter gods they have wooden idols they have Oh, earlier they had a golden calf. They have uh, listened to the Canaanites. They have <clears throat> they have killed their children and, and think that this was a sacrifice to God. And it's still happening in this world today. But in chapter, uh, at the end of 43 and into 44, he says, Assemble the peoples of the world. Which of their idols have foretold these things? You know, our God always loves to tell us first what he's going to do, and then he does it. So where... Um, which of their idols have foretold such things? Which can predict what will happen tomorrow? And where are the witnesses of these predictions? Who can verify that they spoke the truth? 
But you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, to believe in me, and to understand that I alone am God. So what's at stake here is people's confidence in God to save. So when Judah is defeated by Babylon, many will doubt God's ability to save. Maybe they should have trusted those uh, idols. Maybe the other idols were stronger and could have saved them. But this is punishment for sin. He goes on to say, yes, I'm the Lord. There's no other Savior. I predicted, first predicted your rescue. Then I saved you and proclaimed it to the world. So now he's talking again about Egypt. I told you what I was going to do. I, I told the whole world what I did. No foreign god has ever done this. None of those idols of wood and stone and people that I, you know, I hear people in, that don't know the Lord. And I say, do you know God? Oh, yes, I do. Oh, tell me about your God. Well, when I go hiking up in the mountains, you know, the trees are so beautiful, the mountains are beautiful, the sky, the sun, Oh, I just love it. And Oh, that's your God. That's your idol? Getting out in nature? No. What that is, is your joy. And who gave you that joy? The God that created it. That's your joy. Don't get your joy mixed up with your God. Don't let having a good time as a young person be your God. Oh, I want to get out there and have more fun. And... Um, what happens is what is the character he reveals in you the day after you go out and have that fun? What is the character? Is it one that sustains you or is it one that brings you in, into regret? So think about those things. But he saved, he predicted the first rescue saved us all, proclaimed it to the world. No foreign God has done this. You are witnesses that I'm the only God, says the Lord. From eternity to eternity I'm God. No one can snatch you out of my hand. I love that. No one can undo what I have done. I have people that come for ministry saying, well, yeah, I know I submitted myself to Jesus, but I did this and this, and now I don't think he can love me anymore. No. <laughs> he created you. He called you. We didn't call ourselves to Jesus Christ. He called each one of us. He, he put that, wooed you, we say. He, he went out and he, he is the one that called you, and he's going to keep you. And he's going to keep bringing you back to the realization of what you need to do. And then he says, I'm doing a new thing. It's, now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. He's talking about John the Baptist. He's coming. The Lord will save the people of Israel. Israel with eternal salvation throughout everlasting ages. They will never again be humiliated and disgraced. But finally, he says, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. This is the new thing he's, he's hinting of right now. He's giving us a glimpse. And for me, these five chapters were all about giving us a glimpse of who the real God is and uh, who we are and who we can be in him. He's formed us, he's made us, and he has a plan and purpose for each of us. So 
you need to remember these things, that he chose you. He, he created you to live in righteousness with him, giving him the glory. And whatever discipline you're going through today, he has a plan to restore you. And think about, what is your prison today? Where, where were you captured and removed from, from God's sight? What's captured you? Because when you ask him, he surely will tell you. He wants to set you free. And who's that victor in your life? We know that Jesus Christ is the victor. He, he died for your sins. He rose again. No other faith that I know of throughout the world has a Christ that not only died, but rose for your sins. He's living today. He lives in you. And so ask yourself today, <clears throat> how he wants you to see him so let's just say this as a prayer father how do you want me to see you show me your face in a new way today father show me who you are in my life in my circumstances in my character and then help me to change to be the person you created me to be mm. thank you for what you're doing in each of our lives, Father. Give us patience and help us to remember that the battle belongs to you, Father. That you can predict the future because you create the future. And you are victor in our lives every day. In Jesus' name, amen.